I'd like to call to order the July 8th, 2021 committee meeting of the Board of Education. Um, I will entertain a motion that we approve the agenda. However, before we approve this agenda, let me um, let me ask if we can amend the agenda to, in, to include an item for public participation, uh, which we will do following the uh, meeting minutes approval. So uh, that will make uh, public participation item D, and then of course, uh, the corresponding letters after that will fall suit. So uh, I'll then make the motion that we approve the agenda as amended in, to include a public participation item. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Proctor. Um, any discussion? Sorry. Got too much hand-eye coordination going on here. All those in favor? Motion carries. That brings us to item C, that the Harris County Board of Education review the attached meeting minutes from the board meetings held in June. Uh, those are included in your package. Uh, I'll give you a moment to peruse or ask questions if you have any. All right, and being none, if you uh, have questions or edit recommendations, please get those to Mr. Couch and we'll get those updated for next week. Right, and then of course that then will bring us to item D, uh, that the Harris County Board of Education allow for public participation. Uh, Mr. Kaus, do we have any members of the public signed up to speak tonight? No one signed up and no one's contacted our office. Yes. All right, and neither do I see any public in the, um, in the audience. Uh, is there any public participation, public present that would like to participate and make comments tonight? Seeing none, we will move forward to item E, that the Harris County Board of Education listen to a curriculum department update from Dr. Denny. Good evening. Just a couple updates from the curriculum department. First one, computer science, we're actually gonna push until next month. We had some things come up, some things shift, and we wanna make sure we get you the right, the correct information before we do that. But item number two, our Cogni accreditation. While we have not received the official certificate yet, we have been accredited according to the accredita accreditation agency. So we're going, our next step is we're gonna go and make that public and provide all the information about the accreditation process. But other than that, anything on accreditation? All right. If you want to jump to item three on the next page, the 2022-23 uh, calendar survey results. So if you take a look at the, the big picture I have circled, the option B was the one that was most selected. The overall total was 297 for option B versus 183 for option A. And I've show you the breakdown by faculty, staff, and the community. And on the back of that page, you do have a copy of calendar, the calendar B option, just to refresh if you don't know what the difference was. That one was the one that gave a little bit more time before Christmas. So a little bit longer break, that's the one they preferred over the little bit less time before Christmas off. Dr. Denny, just to confirm, this is also the calendar that um coincides closely with the 21-22 as well as Muskogee County, correct? Yes, yep. so this also has um, spring break the first week of April, correct? And, and I do wanna bring your attention to one other thing. There was a change made with Juneteenth being a federal holiday. We've just changed how we denote holidays or uh, denoting how we marked Veterans Day. So if you take a look at November 11th, and we also did this on next year's calendar, so November 11th was typically just green for in service. So we've done a half red, half green box to recognize Veterans Day. And then we added the red box down on June 19th for Juneteenth. All right, I have one more question, if you don't mind. So in looking at the survey results, it looks as if maybe the faculty staff was a little closer. Um, but when you, you know, when you factor in the community, I guess, and then uh, of course, the total, it was pretty significant preference, it looks like to me. Yeah, it wasn't. Sometimes we get those close ones. We haven't had a close one in probably three or four years. This is the last two calendars have been pretty lopsided. 
And I think really when, because of our criteria, the way we do it now, there's so little difference between the calendars. The really, the big place the difference is, is the holiday around, around winter time. And usually you're getting a little bit more time before Christmas, or you're getting a little less time before Christmas. And most people opt for that little bit more time before Christmas. Yes. But Denny, on November the 11th, Veterans Day? Yes. Um, because it's red and green, so I understand, yes, it's a federal holiday, but that doesn't mean that the teachers have a staff in-service day, does it? We do have a staff in-service day on Veterans Day, yes. Okay. So... Yeah, it was all green, and we've done that. If you remember, originally Veterans Day, we, we've we worked and students came on Veterans Day for a long time, and then we moved it over to an in-service day, sort of that compromise between trying to get our days in, recognizing you know families that had veterans in the family, so the students were off, but to get our required time in, you know, we had to make it that in-service day. Any other questions? Moving on. All right. Item number four, if you want to flip. So again, just giving you an update on our graduation rate, co the cohort withdrawal appli application. So what we see, and we just received the application, I think it was a week and a half or two weeks ago, where we could start going in and looking at our numbers. So we're, we're getting close to be able to say, here's what we think our graduation rate's going to be. So if you look at those numbers, basically they categorize students with five major categories, dropout, death, graduate, transfer, and active end of year. So of course our graduates, that's the biggest pool of all the students that entered our system and exited as a senior and actually graduated high school. Dropouts, remember we talked about the unknowns. Dropout is sort of like this big catch-all category where there could be a lot of things that are counted as dropouts. So if you take a look over on the left-hand side down at that bottom picture I have, so notice we have an unknown there. Okay, that unknown is considered a dropout and we have to figure out what that is. Then the next one would be remove lack of attendance. Well, that's considered a dropout. Even though they were, they were enrolled, they just didn't come, we removed them. So that whole list is showing things that count as dropouts. The one that's sort of surprising, other adult education, if they go for their GED, that is considered being a dropout because there is no... At this point in the state, there is no recognition or way for them to receive the information that, hey, Dave Denny dropped out. He got a GED. You know, he met the criteria of that, so he would count. So the last, the second to last column, the transfer. So notice we had 83 students. Any student who comes into Harris County and goes anywhere else, such as another state, another county, another private school, another public school, when we get records requests, we are now noting that, and that's our proof that they transferred somewhere. If they do transfer within the state, the state automatically flicks that flag for us. So those 83 students do not count against us, which is a good thing. And then our active year end, we have 39 students who for some reason, for some reason or another did not graduate. So this would be, those are really the the students this year that were in our school attending their senior year here that did not graduate. Yes. Don't worry about updated. So we, we have to go in and correct this information. So in other words, last week, we may have had four kids that were marked as unknown because we really didn't know where they were. We either got a records request from another school district so we could go in and tag that. We found out they homeschooled, or we do have the situation. We have some, I think we have a total of three where we called, we talked to the family. They said uh, he didn't like school. He dropped out. We have no idea where the child is at this point. So it really is an unknown situation. But the big difference between last year and this year is we will have a reason for those unknowns that we really do not know where they are because either the family doesn't know and we had a couple group home where at the age of 18, the student checked themselves out of school and just went away. But we do, we do get to recategorize a lot of these that we, we may now have excuses for or reasons or knowing where they've gone. 
But again, that's just a sort of a baseline overview again to keep you apprised of the situation. Um, those active year end, one of the things I've been working with Mr. Dunn this week, looking at all these numbers, uh, there's what they also call the summer graduation application. So, you know, we have the summer school going on for the high school where they're regaining their credits. We have, we have up until I think it's August 26th, where if those students make up their credits and they graduate, we can go ahead and flick those to graduated and that number goes down. And of course that's to our benefit. So we know right now, based on what happened in the first session for summer school, I think we had three or four graduate or are eligible to graduate so we can hit that button. And then we're, the next session, we're gonna work on that too. But that also gives the possibility to high school. You know, I told Mr. Dunn, you know, we have that 20, the 20 additional day funds, which are our tutoring funds that we can, you know, we can pay for tutors for these students where if we have to sit down one-on-one, -on -one, you know, at the start of the school year, we need to do something like that, that we can get a couple more through. So we're hoping to get that 39 down to a much smaller number. Any questions on that? I still can't, I still can't give you a number at this point. All right, a percent. You mean a percentage of graduation? Yes. Yeah, but it's gonna be higher than it was last year, right? <laughs> I don't wanna say yes. And no come pressure. Back and not be. You know, we're pretty sure of the process and we think we know what we're doing, but I wanna make sure that that number comes in before we throw something out there. Oh, come on, man. One other thing I will say about that, just to be aware, you know, we've talked about at the state level, these students this year during COVID that just seemed to disappear and not show up in schools. Well, we had some seniors register this year and were very sporadic or did not show up for their virtual classes. So they're gonna be in these numbers and that's sort of where I'm getting at. I don't wanna give you a number yet because some of those students are really working on getting through to graduate and that'll really make a difference. We're at that point where you know, we think two or three could make that difference between 88, 89, 90, 91. You, it's just, we want to make sure that we're, we've got an accurate count of those. All right, on to the next page. We did receive uh, Friday afternoon, we received our packets showing the Georgia milestones results for Harris County, the state and our Reese's. We're not gonna discuss all the details tonight of those, but there is a folder in your binder that shows those comparisons and how we did compare to the state and Teresa, or yeah, Teresa. It's pretty comprehensive. So I want you to have a chance to look over it so we can discuss it next week. One of the things I'll say is, you know, they didn't look great. They didn't look not great. Some areas we showed some improvements. Some areas we showed some real oddities. We're still trying to figure out some things that happen. And I think you'll see that when you, when you go through there. You know, so we, we still gotta have some time to dig up because we know there's gonna be questions on some of these areas, trying to figure out what might've led to the cause of some of the uh, decreases in certain areas. But I do want you to look over that. And again, we'll, I'll give a little bit more in depth overview next week. So that'll be a that'll be a part of the agenda next week for a more thorough conversation. Correct. Uh, one of the things I do want you to take into consideration because we, we've had time to look over this stuff now a few days and we've talked about it repeatedly. Um, some of the general things that that we have taken from it that I want you to remember is, is that in March, April, and May second graders missed three months of the regular school year then they had two more months of summer and then they came in the third grade and in a lot of cases they were still second graders uh -huh. and they they had they were really challenged and they had a hard time and that may have a big impact on why those grades are some of the lowest also one of the things that we generally notice that, that i'm encouraged about is as you go up third grade fourth grade fifth grade sixth seventh eighth the older the student, the less the degree of loss. So I think they had some good school years behind them, which gave them an opportunity to, to go through this thing a little better than the younger kids are the ones who were just really devastated by it. But 
you know, that, and you're going to have a lot of questions. I want you to look over it and, and, and ask anything you want to ask. But our, our whole goal is a plan on dramatically increased student achievement next year. This year, we were more concerned and told our teachers to work on keeping them safe. And they did. But now we gotta we gotta get to the student achievement. Um, talking about the difference in the second and third graders, um, typically that should be statewide, wouldn't it? So do we get any results that will show that statewide? You, you have them in there. So if in you look okay. on the first page. And really, you don't have to look at all the pages because it goes into domains and other other things. But if you're looking for like a general, In some cases, we lost more, and in other cases, we didn't lose near as much as the rest of the comparative group, so. You have questions regarding that? I know you'll want time to, you know, to peruse it. Any questions right now, though? And look, if y'all have any during the week as y'all are looking through it, Dave and I'll be more than happy to talk with you about it. I'll be interested in your ideas because a lot of people are going to be looking at it like y'all going, what in the world? What else you got, Dave? All right, last thing, and I, I apparently forgot to put this on there, but just a real quick summer enrichment program update. So as you know, K-4 to four ended, I believe it was last Thursday, Creekside and middle school were done the previous two weeks ago. And then of course the high school Starts up again July. I actually think they they started. So their next session. Uh, overall, we we sent out a feedback survey of parents for K to four just to see what their thoughts were on it. We got 99 responses, which I thought was pretty big out of a total of 400. Um, and one of the questions just said, "Rate the program on a scale of one to five. Another 99, 94 said five, five being the highest, and the rest of them said four. They really loved it. Um, the kids enjoyed it. The parents loved it. The biggest piece of feedback was we wish it was longer than two weeks, <laughs> which of course, you know, definitely the longer we could have done it. Yeah, that would have been great. I had heard too that the um, programs were packed. Yeah, I mean, we had good participation. It was, we were anywhere from 15 to, with the exception of fourth grade, we had about 15 to 20 students, you know, with a teacher and pair pro. And then sometimes we sort of even divided it out from there. That's uh, that's great. I, I, I hope that will, you know, show positive in, in next year's curriculum and, and, and learning loss. But I appreciate the uh, also the teachers and the staff that you know that made that happen. Uh, that, that's a big number for for summer schools. So uh, glad to hear it went well. Yeah. So they did they did a great job. They had a, a bunch of activities. You know, one of the activities I went on with Mr. Couch and he was picking on me is the uh, the steam farm visit. We went in the morning and it wasn't very cool out. It was very muggy. And by the time we got done walking up the hill, I was I was sweating more than anyone else. But the kids, the kids really did enjoy getting out and the bee presentation and you know the, the steam activities. The parents commented a lot about the, the fact that it just wasn't all academic. It was getting being around other kids, you know, socializing and the fun activities that the, our teachers did. And they really did a great job. And just a little bit of a piggyback off of that, and this is a question, I guess, for Mr. Couch or whoever can answer it, but, um, you know, that was a that toe in the water, if you would, uh, towards uh, August the 6th. How do we feel we did with, with the lack of social distancing, no masks, um, any, any feedback on, on that sample, if you would, prior to the, to the larger gathering in August? Uh, to my knowledge, none of the students, uh, we had no reports that anybody was sick. Uh, we did have one staff member, but she got sick. and showed up, I think, like the second day, so she didn't get it there. She brought it with her. It's one of the pair of pros. But that's the only case I'm familiar with with anybody in the whole district. Uh, and we're monitoring that's encouraging. closely, so we'll see. That's very encouraging. Thank you for that. That is all I have. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.
That will bring us to item E2, that the Harris County Board of Education listen to a Human Resources Department update from Ms. Carlisle. Good evening. Good evening. Um, if you take a look at your points for Human Resources, this is your typical update. And like I said last month, that list is very long. Do not be afraid. We're still in good shape. We have many. Do not be afraid. Today um, is what all? It's see. July. Yeah, okay. Yes, school starts very soon. Um, when you see this list, uh, know that many of those are pending. And I kind of put an asterisk just to kind of give you a heads up. And this is as of Tuesday. And in case you didn't know, in human resources, something happens every single day. So many of these have already, there have been recommendations made. But just to kind of boil this down for you, um, we've got four teaching positions um, still that are out there, but three of the four are very, very close. And I think um, we'll have them all wrapped up by next Thursday. So those are already way down the, into the process of screening and interviewing. We do have a clerical position at the high school that is close on. And then we have some parapro positions that are still available and our principals are still screening for that. So i um, really excited. I want to bring you a summary of the hires for this fall. I want to wait probably another week or two, let it all settle. But um, we've got a big group joining us, uh, 50 plus. So um, we're really excited about that. Um, some of our team members got to meet some of our newest recruits and it's just one of my it's one of the most fun things I get to do in HR, and that's really work hard to bring the very best to the principals. And um, we saw a great example of a wonderful team um, just today. But um, just moving on down, just a few updates, just to remind you of the, um, we're excited about celebrating our plan sponsor, um, national recognition for the 403B plan. And that is next week, and you all were invited at noon. It will be at the Harris County Public Library in the conference room on the side. And we have our um, financial consultants, they're driving in. We have a lot of our Mentoro partners, they'll be flying in from Texas or driving in from across the state. Our um, faculty and staff committee, they were have been a big part of this from the very start. Um, so we just look forward to just taking a moment to just really celebrate um, this achievement, so. Really excited about that. And we were too getting ready, just to let you know, July 27th and 28th, you're welcome to come by. Um, that's new teacher orientation. It'll be at the performance learning lab and the cafeteria. We've got a big group. So we'll, we'll do that in two groups like we did last year. Um, either day, if you wanna drop in at eight as we're starting, we'd love to have you come meet our, some of our best and brightest new recruits and they will be training um, for two days there at the PLL and the PLC. And curriculum will be doing a lot of the training with technology in the mornings. And then about mid morning, we're gonna kind of change gears and we're gonna go into human resources mode just to help, be, help them be prepared for employment and just helping them be successful this year. So they'll have those two days of training with us. And then there's a third day where they'll be, um, on the 30th, they will be at their school site and their principals and their assistant principals and their teacher leaders will be hosting them and orienting them to the building and they're going to hopefully get some time in their classroom. So that's what it's really all about. Absolutely. Ms. Carl, let me uh, piggyback on that just a minute, if you don't mind, um, for uh, primarily for Harry's benefit, but uh, for those of you that may or may not have been able to attend before, those are great events. I mean, the, 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 to see those um, new staff members are excited about being here. Uh, Ms. Carlisle and her team do an awesome job presenting, and um, it's just, it, it really is a great event. But um, I just want to make sure that, that um, we understand our role is to, to, to come at eight if you can come. Uh, it's not required, of course, but if you can, and just welcome and say hey and be introduced and say thank you and welcome welcome to the team. Um, Ms. Carlisle, I, I certainly don't want to get in your business, but would it be helpful if uh, if this team would let Mr. Couch know or Ashley or somebody if they're coming and in which day they're coming, just so you can be That'd a little be more great. prepared. So if you can do that, look at your calendars and, uh, and we'll be there, what, five minutes, maybe 10, because we don't want to stay and get in the way. We just right, right. We just welcome. want to make sure you get to the face. With yeah. We'll have two groups, so we'll rotate between the two rooms. That's okay. one of the things we found that was very effective during the COVID year is to split the group 
and give them that small, small, just make it a smaller group. Uh, so some of those things we learned are good things. So we're going to continue those. Yeah. So let's let's help Miss Carla and her her team out. If you can come, uh, let Ashley know which day. That'd be awesome. Thank okay. you for letting me do that. Okay. That'd be great. But you're welcome. As always, and on August 3, we're looking, it's time for back to school. So it's the back to school kickoff, that big annual event. It'll be at the high school, eight o'clock. We're going to change it just a little bit. We'll, we're planning to do the breakfast mixer with coffee. Probably going to move that to the cafeteria just to help with space and a lot of other things. And then we'll go right to the auditorium at 830. And we're just going to do a, a lot of recognitions, a lot of celebration and the goal is to leave inspired and renewed. So, uh, listen, I, I know I'm not the only one, but I'm so excited to see that back on the calendar this year. That is a fantastic event, just one of the many things that COVID robbed yes. from us last year. So, I'm looking forward to it. Bringing everybody together. That's what it's about. But that's all I have for you at, at this point. Any other comments or questions for Ms. Carlisle? Please. Do we have a uh, theme for this year as of yet? Well, we do. We do um, a little bit. I mean, the theme hasn't been narrowed down, but right now I think Rise Up is a little bit of where we're going. We have a wonderful speaker that's um, booked. Her name is um, Mignon Francois, and she'll be joining us from Tennessee. And I was fortunate to, to be in attendance at a, at a banquet years ago. Matter of fact, Ms. Baker. Um, helped me attend that and um, very inspiring but um, it's going to be great it's going to be fabulous looking forward to it it's going to make a great make for a great start and um, on the action agenda I know you'll come to that later just to give you just a little just to update um, you've probably seen in the news on May 5th Governor Kemp signed House Bill 146 and it's effective July 1 um, 2021 which that's where we are and that's to provide three weeks of paid parental leave for state employees, and that includes local boards of education. And what I've prepared in the proposal, um, Greg Ellington and Merrill Smith, our attorneys, they've looked it over, and it's following the GSBA model. So you'll see that in the action agenda. And I suppose if we have questions, we can discuss that at that point, I suppose, yes. or now if you have them. But I'm, I'm assuming if you're like me, you hadn't had a chance to look at it yet. But if you have questions, you're welcome to present them now. Okay, course, we'll, we'll catch it in a minute. Thank you. Yeah, we'll catch you in a second. What else you got? That's it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, that will bring us to item E3 that the Harris County Board of Education listen to a support services department update uh, from Ms. Baker. Good evening. So good evening. Looking in your binders at the support services section. Um, the first thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is, you know, we put the mobile learning lab back on the road in June. And that was um, apparently welcomed. As you see here, these are our numbers for the, um, the month of June. So we went to Pine Mountain, Shiloh and Whitesville. And these are the number of people that actually visited at those stops. Um, the mobile learning lab will be back on the road on Thursday, July 29th. And I did give you a schedule of the mobile learning lab summer schedule. There is a change. The date is the same for the 29th. The time is the same, but the location is now going to be at the Waverly Hall Community Center. Initially, we were thinking it was gonna be at the Harris County Community Center. So they've changed it to Waverly Hall. So. Can I ask a question about that? Mm -hmm. So in Whitesville, and I don't, I don't claim to have a good enough memory to, to remember what the numbers were when it was running before, but Whitesville seems to be a little bit um, lower number, even historically. Uh, is that due to uh, the location we go to? Is it, I, I know it's, you know, not very densely populated out there, but I just wonder, is there, have we looked at maybe some reasons we can, can help encourage participation right out there in Washington? Because I know it's needed. I just wonder what the hindrance is for getting the participation out there. I'm not sure about that because the reason we went to Whitesville is because the numbers were not as high as Pine Mountain or Shiloh, but they were still pretty steady. So that's why we chose to go to Whitesville because the numbers okay, were pretty good. steady the last time. All right, I, I can't remember as I said, but I, I know it's 18, 13, and three. And I just wonder, you know, I, it, it's, it's certainly needed. I just want to be sure that we make it as available, obviously, as we can. We will. Um, may I ask, where are they parking? At Pine Lake Chapel. 
You might want to talk to Dollar General. Well, we did survey some Dollar General as well, so that may be something that we can consider. Well, you know, we've talked to some people in the community out there. They probably know where they areas they frequent, but it, it kind of varies out there. Sometimes you go to the chapel, and sometimes they show up for meals, and sometimes they don't. Just, and that's what we did with the some with the feedings yeah. last year when we closed school. Right. We actually went to Pine Lake Chapel, but nobody was coming. So I went down to talk with the manager at the Dollar General and everybody started coming. Yeah. So I think it is a visibility because it's right there. Off well, the I know the Dollar General has a big literacy push, so they probably give us an opportunity to come. And I'm, I'm sure they will allow us. I can go back and talk with the manager. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so my next item. Last month, um, I was asked about the numbers for the summer feeding program. So I have given you a five year overall numbers for the summer feedings from June 17 until June, 2021. And you can just look for yourself to see how the numbers actually, how they actually um, lay out here. But you know, last year on June, 2020, our numbers were different because we were able to go throughout the entire community. We took our buses, so we had more feedings. Uh, we were able to give two meals at once versus people coming to pick up one meal for lunch. So our numbers were pretty high last summer. This summer, the numbers are still pretty good considering we only have really serving from one location. Park is our steady location. But because we had summer school at all elementary schools, we have Creekside with the middle school with summer school, and then we have ESY at Creekside. So we were able to serve breakfast and lunch in those programs. So that along with the numbers of the people that are coming to park gives you the number that we have here for um, the month of June. That's significant. I mean, to your point, even if you take out 20, right? Because it's an anomaly. Uh, I mean, that's still double. Mm -hmm. That's, that's awesome. And we're still currently serving. Park is still serving for the month of July. And we're able to serve them and anybody in the community. I know the community center is actually taking advantage of it. The high school is taking advantage of it with their summer activities that are going on. So those numbers are probably going to look pretty well in addition to what you see here. Yes, sir. Now that was anyone up to the age of 18, right? Anyone up to the age of 18. You had any other questions or comments about the summer feeding program? That's really good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for bringing those numbers. Are you welcome? All right, go ahead. All right, so my next item, if you would turn the page, we have launched our Harris County virtual program application process. It actually began on July 1. It will run through July 15th as far as applications go for our currently enrolled students. Any students that are new to the district, of course, we will honor as they come in and we'll receive those applications and review those as um, we, we get them. But um, our summer, I'm sorry, our virtual program is for our medically fragile students. And those are students who have some type of medical condition, chronic illness or something along those lines that's documented by a licensed medical doctor that says that if they go to school, that they're at risk in some way or another, or they are so, um, chronic that their school attendance is affected by their illness. So that's who we're offering the program to. We have no idea. I don't know how many medically fragile students that we have. We don't know. I will hope that doctors remember they took a Hippocratic oath and will give <laughs> the proper diagnoses. I don't know. We hope that we have people that are actually needing the program that will actually apply and be accepted. But um, we do have three different ways for applications to be um, get to be um, given to parents. They can get them either from the website, which is the easiest way but they can also get them from the Hope Center or they can go to their child's home school to get an application. And if you visit our website, you'll see all the information that's listed there that tells you exactly what I'm telling you now. This document in front of you is posted there along with the application. Yes. And this may be a two part question or a two part answer by you or Dr. Denny. So how are, how are the, the virtual students be I guess 
in educator. I mean, would it be like a virtual in like a zoom in the actual class or they have an assigned teacher to them or what is our plan for educating these kids that are you know, going to be fragile? Uh, I'll, I'll ask to address that. We're going to base that primarily on how many we have, what grade levels and what we think would be in their best interest. Um, also, you know, we want everybody to come back to school. And if they're in situations where they're unable to, depending on what the specific situation is, there's different kinds of delivery models we can have. And we can also hire different people. For example, if, if we had, uh, say, 10 elementary teachers, or, excuse me, 10 elementary students across all the schools and all the grade levels, well, I, I don't want to pull a teacher from a classroom to teach 10 students, but we might hire a new teacher with the COVID learning loss money rather than our budget money to provide them with the services they need and that kind of thing. So we, we're looking at a bunch of different avenues and I'm talking with other superintendents to be sure that I'm, we're thinking along the same lines they are. At this point, we're all kind of waiting to see how many medically fragile uh, need the services and then we're gonna, we're gonna move to our, trying to do as best we can, even if they're gonna do it for a year or two and then come back. I mean, I, I want them to come back to school and, and we'll, and we have other virtual options available for kids if that's what they want to do from now on. But I don't think that's in our best interest. Do we know how the numbers are trending so far? Ms. We Patrick? have, as of today, we have five applications. Um, are those students going to be counted in the FTE? Yes, they will be Harris County students. Any other questions? Okay, and I, that's what I mentioned. Initially, it was supposed to be held at the Harris County Community Center. <laughs> yeah, but now it's changed to Waverly Hall Community Center. Okay, and the last item that I have is not on my discussion points, but we did talk on Tuesday about the protocols because everyone is coming back to school. So I have given you this document. I put it into the insert of your binder. Yes, yeah, there. Okay. This is the document that you've seen before. We first created this July 2020. Then we revised it January 2021 when the guidelines changed. And so we have now revised it with the current guidelines as of today. This may change before school starts if something comes out from DPH or from CDC. But as we currently stand, these are our guidelines. The only thing that's different than what you've seen from the previous versions, if you would turn or to the back at the very top, we have added the quarantining for vaccinated persons because there is a, a CDC guidance that says if you have been fully vaccinated, then you will not have to quarantine if you have become in close contact with a COVID positive person. And I wanted to add this here so that everyone knows that this is the expectation. This is students and employees, correct? Well, these are measures of illness prevention. The, I took these bullets from what CDC says can help us from getting sick. This is not saying you have to wear. This is just a measure to take to keep you from getting sick. Yes, that's our option. Yes. Uh, also, too, are we going to continue to monitor students' uh, temperatures when they come in, or just if we think they might have a test? We are still going to monitor, and if you will notice on the very first part of this document, on the very first section, we are asking parents if they would please as well to check their students' temperature before they leave in the mornings, but we are still going to be monitoring at school as well. And Ms. Baker, um, how, what approach are we taking to determine if a student is fully vaccinated or not? Is it a uh, scout's honor or are we asking for some type of documentation? What, what's the approach? We can ask for documentation. I'm not recommending that. I'm just asking what is the approach? We can, act, we can ask for documentation. Yes. You know, dealing with students and dealing with, with parents, and, and this is true across our race and across the states for the, the, the superintendents I've spoken with. If, for example, we're you come up positive for COVID, whether you're vaccinated or not, if you come up positive, and then I say I'm 
I've been vaccinated, I need to show that. If not, it's considered you have to do the sick leave. Right. Okay, so it's so it's voluntary. Mm. If if I if I want to stay in the school, I can volunteer. Otherwise, it's assumed that I'm not fully vaccinated and I'm gonna follow the protocols. Right. That I understand. Thank you. So kind of to piggyback on top of that, Ms. Baker, how mm -hmm. has the vaccinations gone that we have done? I'm going to jump ahead or take you your thunder. No, that's my next point, actually. I was going to close with that. <laughs> if there are no more questions about this part, up, then I, I'll go ahead and jump into that. The vaccinations have gone very well. Um, on June, June 17th, when we did the first dose for everyone 12 and older, we had about 80 people. Today was the second dose for all those people that were vaccinated on June 17th. So by the time school starts, they'll be fully vaccinated. So we're having one other vaccination clinic, which is going to be on the same day as our kickoff. So I just confirmed with the Harris County Health Department today that they will set up in Harris County um, High School's cafeteria. And when we're done with our kickoff, all employees, and if they want to bring their spouses or their children, can come and get vaccinated after we're finished with kickoff before they go back to their schools or back to their respective places. So that's right now scheduled from 10 o'clock until about two. But of course, DPH does not turn anyone away. If someone comes in while they are still there, they will go ahead and go through the process. So what would be the protocol, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. what would be the protocol for the second follow-up shot if we do the kickoff? I'll have to get with DPH and get the date. Of course, it'll be 21 days afterwards, but we'll have to find a location for that. You mentioned this would be for the employees, their spouses, and their children. What about our students? The same group that actually came today. Everyone that's open today, which was all employees, whether you're certified or classified, employee spouses, students age 12 and older, and community coaches who work with Harris County School District schools. So basically anyone student or adult, if I'm understanding right, that's associated with the school district. Yes, or their spouse. Good question. Go ahead, Dr. Sparks. Oh, I thought you had another question. Well, it's not open to the community. Anymore. Not to the community. DPA specified that with me today. They don't want the community to come in with this. They really want to hold this just for Harris County School District. Thank you for clarifying that though. Any other questions or comments about that? Thank you so much. Okay, if there are no more questions then that concludes my report. Thank you. All right, and that brings us then to item E4 that the Harris County Board of Education listened to a facilities and technology update from Dr. Feeney. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thanks for having me here tonight. Um, the first item I'd start with is the exciting one. And each one of you have a concept of the potential layout for athletic facilities. Um, and then on your book, when you came in, um, you should have seen a phase one uh, budget document here. And so uh, you can take a look at those. And as you see on the schematic, you can see um, the big red areas there is the, um, the 4,000 seat grandstand at the football field. Um, that big red uh, rectangle in the middle is the athletic facility, the multi-use athletic facility. You see new parking around there in yellow. Um, those blue outlines of the parking areas are sidewalks, curbs and gutters. And then you see the potential to lay out a softball field and a baseball field um, where that soccer field is. Um, and that's still up for discussion, um, whether we do those fields or we leave that a soccer field. Yes, sir. Dr. Finney, what are, I got an assumption of what they are. What are those, I'll call them three speed bumps on that road, on the road? Those are crosswalks. Crosswalk. Mm -hmm. And we can make those, we can actually make those, those speed tables um, to slow traffic down going down through there. But those are crosswalks. And of course, the um, the anticipated expense sheet from the budget. This is this is this number is for what you're looking at here. It, yes. As we adjust it or whittle down, yes, it'll, it it'll adapt. But this is this is a concept, and this is what it would cost to do this 
as the concept is now. This is everything except the athletic facility building. That would be phase two. This is everything in phase one. That's why I wouldn't try and, and clarify. So it's itemized. Phase one is itemized. So say if we took the softball and baseball field out of there, you could subtract those numbers up there Got it. for the softball and baseball field. If you only wanted to do half of the parking on the one side, you can see down here in the alternates um, what that cost would be. Good. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, so in, in my mind, assuming, let's say, you know, 1A, if you would. I mean, immediately, I think we all have discussed and agreed that we are moving forward with the new grandstand. So that's that's sort of the immediate project that is yes, going sir. to start. Mm -hmm. So does that include just the orange or is that all the blue and orange and whatever else is associated with that grandstand right there? So it would include the orange and we would probably want to do all the parking and the curbs and gutters with that grandstand um, that comes along with that. And then also um, what the architect recommends is to go ahead and grade off the pad where the building would be. And we would have that pad already sitting there. While you um, got the equipment out there? Right, while we've got the equipment out there. That would save some uh, mobilization and some grading and so forth when we do build that building. That's one thing. Yes, sir. Um, now you were saying, are we gonna do all of this? parking area or just part of it? Or? So the part that's on the east side um, where the soccer field is at, um, that is we consider kind of essential and down here around the building. The one that's on the west side um, where the water tower is, that is we added that in as an alternate. So the architect knows we can choose to do that or not do that um, at an additional cost. So it's, it's just depends on if we want to spend that money on that side, that's an alternate. Do you feel like we'll need that parking? I feel like we would need that parking if we can do it. Um, because when we build this stadium, we have the potential to um, host playoff games, not just for our divisions, but other divisions. And um, we, we run very short on parking when we have a football game up there. Yeah, but that was my concern because yeah. Like say, once you do have a big game, everybody parks all along there. And in the past, when we've done projects, we've been kind of hesitant to save a few mm -hmm. bucks, not to pay stuff, mm -hmm. and we come back to do it. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, if we're going to do this, the equipment's there. We might as well go ahead and do it all at one time and have it be done with. Those parking lots are also going to help us with student parking, possibly, and also um, loggering um, car riders for the middle school. Several. Um, One at a time, please. Okay. Uh, in, in regard to the parking, th that is one of the ways that we think it's essential in order to get everybody off the mob as soon as possible. You know, the traffic's going to be coming in. They go in here. They wait to do what they need to do. It's a place to keep them off that road. Um, but one of the things I am concerned with is this 8.851. We don't have that much at this point. Mm -hmm. Now, we may have that um, six months into it, but I do think that it's essential that we look at the, the drive. We're going we're gonna to come back to you with a recommendation. I'm more than interested in your input. And yes, we're looking at phase 1A and phase 1B. And, and I, think, I think the parking, the grandstand, the east side parking, the grandstand, and the widening of the high, the roads that, that are the exits on the way out, those things are essential. And I think we can do that for somewhere in the neighborhood of six and a half million to six million, which we have and we could do. Megan's making money all the time. So we'll just, we'll work on that. And I do think that, and, and as you look at the fund equity, you will see that it's like 4 million over the 10, but that's before we've accumulated all the unspent money. So we know that the fund equity will go up. I just hope it goes up enough to cover phase 1B, A, hey, and then we'll see about the B as we get into it. That's a good point, uh, Mr. Costner. I mean, you're up, I know you said yeah, you had several comments, but that, that's a good point if we can break it down even, uh, even more minimal, because again, um, my opinion, as I said last time we were here, we have to do both ends. So we, we, need to, we need to do this, but we also have got to remember 
Um, we have elementary schools that are gonna have to be addressed. We, I mean, every day there is a new subdivision approved, it seems like in this <clears throat> county. And um, so we wanna be sure that we do both and that we are addressing the needs of our future scholar athletes, but simultaneously paying attention to the building needs we're gonna have and not, um, not commit ourselves too far out. We can't, uh, we can't do what we have to do for the, the educational piece. So that's just another caution for this team. Yes, ma'am. I had a question about the furniture, fixtures and equipment. Mm -hmm. What furniture is that? Because if, you, if I understood it right. This well, um, in this phase one plan that it, the baseball fields are included. So there would be a concession stand um, that goes with that. There would be dugouts that go with that. Um, there's going to be concession stands and things like that um, under the grandstands. So there would be ice makers, some appliances, some chairs and tables, and, and so forth. Thank you. I just yes. saw the bleachers and saw yep. it. No. Yep. Okay. Any other questions on that? Good. That's exciting. Okay. The next thing, uh, the next thing I have is um, the information here on the insurance RFQs or open bids that we're about to undergo. And we've, you, you know, as a board, I've been tasked with um, um, researching this and we're going to um, look as good stewards of the taxpayer's money as to um, what our options are for insurance. So this first informational page explains to you the difference between an RFQ, a request for qualifications to select a broker, or the other option would be open bids where um, you give the specs to all of the brokers and the brokers go out and find the um, companies that can provide us with that insurance spec. Pay close attention to there because there's some um, details in there that it's not the same as when we bid a building because broker, if I've got broker A, B and C, if broker A gets out there really quick and um, contacts all of these companies that write for schools, Broker B and C cannot contact those companies. Um, so um, it could be more advantageous for us to select a broker based on an RFQ, a request for qualifications. And you'll see this thick document is a very in-depth request for qualifications that asks those brokers all kinds of questions about um, their experience with schools and schools like ours and um, insuring bus fleets and uh, the type of insurance specifications that we want. Um, and then we can select a broker based on their reputation, um, some of their services, um, their experience. And we have a lot of choice in, in an RFQ to select a broker. Um, so that information there is for you to give us in, input as to which um, process we would like to embark on. And um, if, uh, if you would like to, to, to give some input and uh, whichever method we choose after the meeting next week, um, we will go ahead and put this into action um, and uh, move from there. The timeline, yes, sir. The timeline would be, um, we would get this RFQ or uh, out as quickly as possible and have it before the end of uh, August. And it, then it gives us time to select um, the plans and all of the uh, specs that we want. Um, the broker would then go to market in September. Hopefully by October, we're starting to get some packages together for you guys to review. Um, and then we wanted to get it to you like we did this year early enough where you had a couple of months to review it. And um, so that would be through October and November. And then December, you guys would act um, uh, on an action item to either accept that um, bid package. And then um, in January, it would go into action. I had a couple of questions, that's yes, all right. Sir. So um, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the timeline as well. Uh, Cause I think, I mean, if we, we may find that we uh, retain the same broker we have now, Possibly. right? We may not move. And so if that's the case, then the timeline goes like it always has. If we if if we do change broker brokerage firms, I, I think your approach here gives ample time uh, to to market that business out to you know for the new broker to market that. Now I said that 
understanding that uh, there are people sitting at this table more qualified to speak to that yes, than I am. And me too. Yes, okay. Sir. And so, uh, first of all, my, my opinion is uh, the RFQ, the re request for qualifications is the way to go. My opinion means nothing except for that's my opinion. All right. I would like to ask um, anybody around the table, of course, that has questions, but specifically Mr. Green, uh, as to uh, your opinion regarding the RFQ or the RFP, uh, as well as the timeline presented. Um, any comments about this? Well, I'll just preface that by saying you can do the RFQ and request, of course, their qualifications, but you may have the best qualified people out there, but they have the worst rates in the world. So you also have to consider that when you're looking at these things, because they may paint a pretty picture and say, oh, we've got all this, but at the end of the day, that's not the best bang for your buck. But you could ask for some of that historical data experience from the for other districts. And show, show us what the rates have been for that other district. Um, yes. So, Dr. Denny, um, does this RFQ go out on the procurement website for everybody to yes, have sir. the opportunity it to would. go on? Basically? It would, yes, sir. It would. Um, the state law requires that anything over $100,000 uh, be posted on the Georgia Procurement Registry. And I'm sure this would be over $100,000. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm very sure. <laughs> and I'm very sure. Well, the thing, the thing I like about that is that it, does, it opens us up to be able to market it for other brokerages outside of our area mm -hmm. who we may not even know about that yep. could yep. help reduce some of these costs when it comes to our, you know, our insurance when it comes to that stuff. Yep. Any comments or questions from my left side? I, I got another question. Yeah, I was gonna, I'm gonna come back. Well, no, you go ahead, because I got something else I wanna ask you. So, you Dr. D, you may not even know the answer. How have we done this in the past? Because I know we've had the same broker for years and years and years. Did we RFQ it back then and they just have been our brokers they've, forever? Or? They've been with us for as long as I can remember. Hutchison and Trailer has. Well, the and, person I asked that is Steve, because uh, I don't think we've had Hutch and Trailer since everybody sitting around this table has been on the board except Steve. So Do you that, recall when it was? Yep. Yeah. And so they've, um, this gives us a chance uh, through an RFQ to really compare that, ask questions of different brokers. Um, but also we know what Hutchison Trailer has done and, 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 and there's our benchmark right there to compare these other, these other plans. For instance, um, the cybersecurity insurance that they, um, uh, got us involved in at really at their recommendation, that saved us a lot of money this year, upwards of almost a, a half a million dollars for a $10,000 deductible. For that, we're very grateful. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Scott, I want to ask you a question as well. And of course, anybody, I'm not just specifically asking Scott, but I know he has some experience in this area. But, um, and, and I, of course, will, and I ask everyone to, but will you, assuming, I mean, and I may be the only one that, that thinks we need to go with an RFQ, but if we go with an RFQ, uh, you know, just look through here and see if you have some other thoughts or questions mm -hmm. that may want to be included yes. uh, as a recommendation. And uh, Mr. Couch and Dr. Finney can take those under consideration. And when we write the RFQ, we can put anything in there that we want. And, um, you know, we can write in there that we can select the best, we can select the plan that's in the best interest of the school district. Yeah. And I would, and I, that's a or good point you make Dr. Finney, because I would say you only get one, you don't get one, but, but you, you get one chance to ask most of the questions. Let's be sure we get them all. Mm -hmm as many as we can to begin with, but you know, any, any direction or feedback for Dr. Finney is your preference on the RFQ or RFP based on the information we've just gotten. I think it's used a way to go. Okay. okay we're not voting on that. Of course, we'll okay. talk about that again next week. Okay, sure. It sounds like that's going to yep. be kind of general direction. Any other comments or questions on that? I mean, right, it, might not, it might not be a bad idea because I know we did this and, I don't, I don't think Ms. Carlisle was even here yet. Um, it is. <laughs> um, but I know, and I don't know, this is a, just a thought is all this is. And so we looked at changing our health broker three years ago. Ms. Carlisle, is that right? No. 
we we reached out or i know um dr martin reached out to i think risa and they had and they brought in brokerages and gave us a dog and pony show i mean i'm not saying we have to do that but i mean this gives you an opportunity to meet the people that may be interested in and bidding on this as well, as well. I don't know if we can honestly do that going through the RFQ process, but I think you can. Um, and then it, it gives you a feel of who you're fixing to deal with anyway before you ever get in, before you ever get in bed with them. So. All right, what's your next item? Well, I wanted to give you just kind of an update of where we are with our, with our summer projects. Um, and I know, I didn't include this in your packet because I've given it to you before, but my little color-coded spreadsheet, if you've still got it at home, um, you know, at New Mountain Hill, we've installed a new fence around the detention pond and painted the front entrance. Um, the park intercom refresh and fire alarm refresh is in progress. We finished all the projects at Creekside with the outside painting, the inside painting, uh, all of the flooring except one classroom and two classrooms of furniture. Um, Pine Ridge, we've um, finished um, most of those projects, except we are finishing up with um, a couple of the portables uh, with some flooring. Uh, the portables has, have been painted inside and out. Three of them have new floors. Um, and so we're finishing that up, two classrooms of furniture. Harris County High School, um, all the painting has been finished. The kitchen roof is being finished this week. Um, the stage lighting has been replaced um, and it's, it's, really, it's really good. Um, stage floor, we hope to start that this week. Um, for Mulberry Creek, the kitchen roof replacement is complete and um, we're waiting to paint some of the front entrance. Um, we're waiting on the repair to the roof maintenance shop, but that can be delayed because it's not uh, essential for school. Um, the bus parking area at Pine Ridge is in progress. All of our kitchen equipment um, at the schools has been replaced. Well, what we were replacing has been installed. Um, we also completed a renovation of all the basketball goals in the high school gym. So they raise and lower now safely. Dr. Penny, what's the update on the um, air conditioning use at the high school? Okay, that was my next thing. Uh, we're still on track to have, the, um, to have the HVAC finished at the high school the last week of July. Uh, met with the architects and the contractors and subcontractors today. And I said, at all costs, we have to have this done on time. And we are still on time uh, for the HVAC renovation. It's been inconvenient. It's been, uh, you know, we've been working around moving parts and stuff, but uh, that's to be expected. Uh, but what's not to be expected is we've got to be finished on time. And that's what I told them. Yeah, so we're on time with the... Uh, renovation at the high school when we come back on august the 5th and sit at this table i'm going to reserve that question for mr goodno okay uh because i know it's coming and we um we've already contracted with um or arranged not contracted as part of the contract we've arranged for jackson heating and air to have two or three people on standby that first week of school here at the building so that when a teacher walks in and turns their air conditioner on and doesn't understand the controls or something, you know, doesn't work quite right. Somebody's right there to, to fix it on time. Um, the Harris County Carver Middle School construction is on time. Um, they hung the basketball goals today. They've got all the lights up in the gym. Um, they've got one of the floors all the way down the hallway on the first floor tiled. Um, it's, it's really coming along. Uh, just very excited. All of the Harris County Carver Middle School furniture has been ordered. Um, along with the wireless access points, the switches. Um, we finished the bids um, for the weight room. So we're ready to um, uh, arrange for the weight room uh, equipment to be ordered. Um, so that project is just, it's going great. I know um, I saw or somehow we talked about a you know, potential date at some point for uh, yes. ribbon cutting for, for public view. And of course, that's several months down the road, but uh, I'm glad to see that we're at least considering that. And, um, you know, that, that's an awfully large building with an awfully large amount of people. We may want to consider doing, I mean, when, when y'all are looking at the dates, I don't know, Sunday afternoon or, or early evening, you know, when, when parents aren't working, 
because I, I can, I, I may be wrong. They may not be nearly as interested as we are, but I would think if I got a kid come into that building in January, I'm going to be real interested in walking through that. May thing. I, may I throw some suggestions while we're, I'd love for you to. Okay. So we would like to, uh, either at the first or the second board meeting, it's up to you guys, um, before that first or second board meeting in November, have the ribbon cutting over there where we invite VIPs from the county and uh, the school district and the staff of that district and do it like we did Creekside before the meeting, before this meeting. Um, probably about a week later, um, have we're planning on having a day where we bring shuttle all of the kids and the teachers in about three different groups over to the middle school so they can go see their classrooms and walk around and everything. And so then they go home and tell them how exciting it is to their parents. And then one evening to be determined, hopefully before Thanksgiving, but we could do it between Thanksgiving and Christmas, um, is have an open house at night where parents in the community could come and walk through. And we'd like to wait until November to do that so that most of the furniture and most of the technology and everything will already be in there and set up. Yeah, that sounds fun. Yep. Exciting. Oh, it's exciting. Um, real quick, I'll just kind of update the rest of these in transportation. Ongoing HVAC uh, systems are all being serviced on every bus. Buses being washed starting next week. Ongoing preventive maintenance and services of all buses. Driver, new driver training starts July 19th. Um, we're beginning a routing with our updated map systems and um, we're working on the transportation plan for Harris County Carver Middle School and the high school with the uh, school administrators. Yes, sir. Have your new buses arrived yet? No, our new buses will not be here until August. Yep, so they're gonna be um, probably a couple weeks late after the start of school, but we still have every route bus with an air conditioner. Yes, sir. Um, right now we need six drivers and we've got three lined up for training, but we've got enough to um, run all of our routes for school. Uh, and we should have a couple more coming in to the uh, program this next week. So we're in good shape with drivers. Yes, ma'am. Once the new buses arrive and they're implemented uh, into the rotation, what would be the oldest bus that we would have? I think it's going to be a 2004, maybe a 2005. I'll get that information for sure. Yep. And um, remind me, I know last year, of course, we had masks and we had hand sanitizer. Oh, uh, the masks are not going to be required. Are we still going to offer or have hand sanitizer available on the, did we have hand sanitizer on the bus? On what? On the bus last year. It seems like we had sanitizer stations. We did not have hand sanitizer okay. stations. Okay, I was on mistaken. The bus. Okay, All right, that's fine. Um, summer cleaning is ongoing. Um, they've, they've done very well working around summer school. Um, so we're on track to be ready for that. Our new um, custodian manager, Charles Blackman, He's doing a really uh, good job with Tim um, getting that going. Maintenance is ongoing, continuing all of the HVAC maintenance on the uh, air conditioners. We just replaced all of those 200 fittings at Pine Ridge, the same as we did Park last year um, on those fittings that corrode. You know, we're, we're working on over 2,000 air conditioners across the district, um, getting them ready to go. Replacing lights in the schools, flooring, uh, replace the underpinning at some of the um, – uh, portables at the high school got that repainted um, striping parking lots in all of that oh they installed all of the kitchen equipment and all of that they did uh, completed 120 work orders in the month of June alone um, technology all the technology has been ordered for the schools that they requested all the Chromebooks have been ordered um, Harris County Carver Middle School the high school Creekside have all received theirs we're waiting on the elementary schools. Um, like I said, the technology for the new middle school has been um, ordered. The ransomware event has been officially closed. Um, and the techs are busy with the network preventive maintenance and upgrades. Looking forward over the next three weeks, principals meeting next week where we're gonna start looking at revising and updating safety plans and requirements testing cameras, radios, alarms, SRO checks, 
OLR completion, um, each uh, school principal is going to schedule a walkthrough with me um, to go over their safety plans and their buildings before school starts. Um, and that's where we're at. So I'm subject to any questions. Yes, ma'am. I know the students are returning, but it still gets Please. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We took them up in a very methodical manner and we've got them cataloged and pre-placed already. Um, so um, unless the kids get one of the new Chromebooks, we've got a what we think is a very efficient plan to get that same Chromebook back in that child's hands. Yes, sir. I know some of this may be for executive session because it involves security, but do we know exactly how they got us, how the cyber attack took place? No, we know how they got us generally. We don't know exactly which computer or, or which account, but we know the methods that they um, used. Um, but um, other than that, it's not specific as to how and where. Yep. Yes, sir. Um, did we ever find out um, if we were losing the SRO at Park and then? Yes, the SRO, the current SRO at Park will be departing and um, Chief Walden is working on a replacement for us for the beginning of school. And second part, do we know last year with uh, our technology program and the Chromebook plan, how many did we actually lose? I'll have to get that information for you. Yes, when, when you lose them, we cut them off. And as you remember, I, I, I always emphasize this, we have purchased that coverage that when we lose one, it's replaced. Right, and uh, to your point though, Steve, I would just be curious as well, just to yeah. see what the, uh, the movement was on that. Yep. Any other questions? Any other comments or questions? Thank Thanks you, sir. For your time. Okay, and that will bring us then to item F1, that the Harris County Board of Education review for approval of the attached table policy, addition of GBIA teacher evaluation appeals as proposed. Uh, we reviewed that uh, policy last month as it is required uh, by legislature. So uh, we'll take action on that next week. It has sat for the appropriate amount of time. And so we'll do that. If you have any comments or questions on that particular, um, that particular item. Okay. Then we will go to item F2 that the Harris County Board of Education review the review for approval, the attached tabled pol proposed policy revision request to board policy IDE competitive interscholastic activities. This is also an updated uh, policy based on legislation um, that has been tabled as well. Any comments or questions on that item? All right, we'll take, I am, take action on that next week as well. Item F4, that the Harris County Board of Education approve the GSBA governance team of the year application uh, be submitted upon completion. Uh, and if it's okay with this board, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and address um, uh, that. I thought we had the, maybe not. I thought we had two awards there that we were gonna be looking at. Uh, Mr. Couch, you want to speak to the Governance Team of the Year Award? Uh, anything we need to know about that? I know it's, it is time. We have to approve that in order to submit application. Um, it's exciting been, to be in there. I've been informed that we're putting the final touches on it. I'm looking at Ms. Ashley. I'm assuming he's telling the truth. Anything, anything you need to add to that, Ashley? No, sir. He's spot on. We're putting on the final touches, and we submit it next Thursday, the 15th. Okay, and I, I, yeah, I think uh, the, the other one I was referencing is um, the exemplary board application. So we are um, submitting applications for, for both. Uh, the governance team of the year, the exemplary board, we meet the qualifications for for sure, assuming everyone has finished their, their training. The governance team of the year, there are certain criteria and you have to be invited. So that application is going together, I'm assuming by being on this agenda item, we qualify. Is that correct, Ashley, or Mr. Couch? 
Yes, sir. We were invited to apply for the um, governance team of the year, and that one is due next Thursday, the 15th. And then the exemplary board application is due August the 2nd. So we'll have them both submitted. All right. So for the governance team of the year, uh, if we take action on that next Thursday, is that going to be too late? Do we need to do that tonight to give you the permission to submit that application? Um, no, sir. Next Thursday is good. All right. So we'll take action on both of those items. Um, and if you don't mind, I'd be curious as to uh, um, and the team of I'm, I'm there. I'm thinking last year we applied or the um, yeah there was a there was a unique award though what was that award we I can't remember the name of it now but it was based on the steam farm. So create, yeah, the creative idea. So hopefully that will come down the pike at some point as well. We'll see. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Ashley. Any questions on those two items? Is there anyone that has not completed their training? Okay. All right. And uh, perfect. I'm sorry. I think you're right, Steve. I, I can't keep it in my mind. Yeah, no, you're right. I, I'll, I'll tell you how I approach that. I, I pick up the phone, I call Ashley. And uh, so whatever Ashley says we're supposed to have and whatever Ashley says we have, that's the gospel. So if you're unsure, get in touch with Ashley. <laughs> yeah, you can see it there for sure. It's, it's, it's much easier to call Ashley. So... But, it, but all that said, if you are missing uh, some hours, and um, let's be sure and get those knocked out before we take action on next Thursday so that um, we're not holding Ashley up in the, the application process. All right? Any other comments or questions on that? Wonderful. Then let's move on to item F5, that the Harris County Board of Education review for approval of the attached Proposed board policy GARHB paid parental leave. Uh, Mr. Couch, I believe this is the policy that Ms. Carlisle referenced earlier. Uh, would you or she one like to speak to that? We do want you to take it. They have now, and then you'll be voting on it. You have to take. Table it, don't yeah, you? I mean, yes, yeah. so you've got so you may have some more discussion it, next you, week. If you want to go over it and think it through, and then I'd be happy to. Can you give us the highlights? I mean, I understand what a paid, paid, you know, leave pause is, right. but what, what this, this is something from the, uh, the governor has, well, the legislature has, has mandated. I think you mentioned that earlier, right? But what are, what are some of the high, high level specifics? Well, it's a benefit for um, parents and the governor saying they're trying to honor the service of state employees and educators that upon uh, the birth of a child, the adoption of a child or um, fostering a child that parents would be provided 120 hours of paid leave to, to for bonding time and, and transitioning if it's an adoption or a foster child to bring them into the home. So it would run concurrent with FMLA. And I think we're all familiar with that 12 weeks and um, it would be a rolling year. So if you were to um, apply for that leave on August, let's say July 31, then that's when the 12 months um, starts for that year. And um, as that year progresses, some people may choose to take the 120 hours from the outset. Um, however, some people may choose to take a few days and save some time for later during that year. Um, for us, uh, we are in our policy and in reviewing it, um, our leave protocol works off half days and whole days. So we are, the recommendation is um, that you can take a half day because that matches our leave system instead of by the hour, which does not match our leave system. Those are a few points of it. 
Um, one other thing is it does not matter how many adoptions or births or fostering events you would have within that 12 months. You get that 120 hours and um, regardless of the number of qualifying life events and you know, if you have two, two parents in the same district, each parent would get the 120 hours. And if there's any leave left over at the end of the 12 months, it does not carry over and there's no cash value or leave value that would, um, that would follow with that. So let me make sure I, bless you, let me make sure I understand what I think I heard you just say. So it is, uh, you're, you're saying it's 120 hours not per leave, but per child? For the year. For the year. For the year. So if I, if I adopt brother and sister, I still only get 120 for that one adoption. It's based on the qualified event, based on not the, the children, right? Based on the wording, it's based on the, no matter how many uh, events you get that 100, it says regardless of the number of qualifying life events that occur during such period. So you get that 120 hours for the year. Okay. No matter if it's one child or three children or 10 children. Right. So, but I, so if I, if I have a child, I get the 120 hours and then three months later, I adopt a child. I get another 120 hours. I understand that. If I adopt two children at the same time, I get 120 hours. I don't get 240. Yes. Based okay. on the, on the, on the way it is okay. stated. However, um, a lot of personnel administrators across the state are saying that the way the governor issued it, it, it is a little bit vague and there's a lot of questions like you're saying different scenarios. Um, but, but that is, that is how it's written. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's why I thought I read it, but yes. I, I wouldn't have sworn to that. Uh, the other question I have is you mentioned it. Um, and if I, if I recall when I read uh, the, um, the legislature's, um, words on this, it, it, it mandates that it has to be rolling. Uh, yes. our, our FMLA policy is calendar year. Yes. Um, which I still think is the best way to go. But, you know, but this, this brings another aspect because, because it, although it could run concurrently, right, if I qualify for FMLA and I qualify for parental leave and, I'm, and it's for the birth of a child, then they would run concurrently, right? I would get FMLA, you know, the ticker would start for that. Simultaneously, my parent parental paid leave would start ticking, right? So it'd be it runs simultaneously, but not necessarily, right? So if I qualify for FMLA for another qualified leave event that's not relevant to, to, to parental paid leave, and I've I've taken six weeks of my FMLA, I only have six weeks left, or whatever the right number is, then um, then I have a baby, uh, then I you know, the six weeks of FMLA, I still qualify for it's a qualified event and simultaneously qualify for this new pay parental leave. Am I tracking right? You are tracking exactly right. And that is why a lot of people across the state are saying that why the selection of absolutely designating that rolling calendar year, um, it does throw a few. I absolutely and agree. And in the research of this policy with Mr. Couch, it did bring to our attention that um, we are on the calendar year and that um, there are options that we could actually, if we wanted to explore resetting what our year would be, because there are a few more options out there. That's just sure, you could do calendar, you could do fiscal year, or you could say from exactly. September to September, whatever you want and to do. And for us, we, we don't really work a January. Our employees, for the most part, would be, you know, our fiscal year would be July, where most of our employees are you know, start t teaching staff would be August. That would be something to look at, that if we wanted to adjust. Yeah, it so could. it opens up many questions. Yeah, it does, no explore. doubt. And it could, you know, I mean, just off the top of my head, I I don't, administratively, I don't think you gain anything by moving that date. I mean, because you still got to track two pathways, right? So when, when your team is tracking FMLA, they got to keep an FMLA track and they got to keep a paid leave. Even... Even for the districts that are going to that, that have rolling calendars uh, for their FMLA, to me that would be even more of an, of, a, of an yes. That that's even more of an administrative yes. nightmare. Uh, yes. I'm unbelievable. Um, but again, whether it's fiscal or, or calendar, you still got two tickers going. Um, 
and, and there's some other variances there. We're not here to debate that tonight for sure. But but I just want to make sure I understood the policy here. Now, uh, not to consume the conversation, but help me with what I read as to who qualifies. So if, uh, I'm reading here, and I, uh, I don't have my I don't have my notes with me. I apologize. Um, but the employees, okay. Right, full time. Um, the employees classified as full time by the district, and they're eligible for TRS, which is Teacher Retirement System, or the um, PSERS, which is Public School Employees Retirement System. Um, the employee would have to have had six continuous months of employment under the Board of Education, whether regardless of whether he or she is eligible for paid or unpaid leave under federal law. So that can I pause you right there? <laughs> yeah, because that was one of my questions. Whether or question. not they apply. Yeah. One of my questions, because it specifies six continuous months with the board. So it's six continuous months with the Harris County Board of Education, not six continuous months of being employed by a board. Our board of education. Okay. Yes. Because as, as individuals transfer into our district, that there, there's an eligibility there too for, for FMLA. So that would be similar. And then also it gets into um, the details of employees that are, as far as pay, um, employees paid on an hourly basis must have worked a minimum of 700 hours over the six month period immediately preceding the request. So if you have, um, you know, those that work off the timesheet number of hours, and I know some of our cafeteria workers they have so many, some work six hours a day, others work seven hours a day. That would, that would bring that group in too for criteria. Um, and just for research, just for informational purposes, um, we do have, I think about three individuals that could qualify just in doing a little research of what we have right now. Um, we've had one person inquire, so. Um, I'm sorry, explain that a little better. So we've, we've had three people that would qualify the first seven days of this month. They have inquired because they are already, they're pregnant. Oh, they're going they're to have a child. Oh, okay. They're yeah, going yeah. to have a child yeah. and so they are aware of this policy. Of course. So as they're planning their leave, um, we're already starting to talk with just at least one individual about this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if your birth or adoption falls after July the 1st, then this is applicable. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I got you. All right. Thank that. I'm, I may have more. I, I'm with you, Ms. Carlisle. I, I don't understand the specificity of the governor to say it has to be rolling calendar. Yeah. But um, it is what it is. So right. thanks for bringing that. Any other comments or questions, Scott? So like if we've got some we got educators who are on a nine month or 10 month contract and they have a baby during the summer. Do they qualify for this? And yes. there's one specific that we yes. both know about. 12 months. 12 months. Because I know we've had educators have one this month already. Yes, sir. And last month. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So if you have questions through the week, if things come to mind, feel free to, you can send those to me and I'm gonna continue to kind of dig down in this as well, but um, we are, we're already getting our, the form, the application is pretty much ready. We're just putting the final touches on that. And um, just like we conquered COVID leave, you know, we're gonna, if we can do COVID leave twice, we can do this. and. And if we, we do FMLA every day and our team does a great job with that and um, with finance and the leave department collaborating with, with us on our end, I, I, we can do this. Well, it's a great benefit, uh, no doubt. I just wanna be sure that you know we, we meet the law, of course. Absolutely. And, and that we do it with the least amount of impact on our administrative staff. Um, yes. Because it is, it, it, at the surface, it appears to be very, administratively heavy yes. uh, and I'd be curious too because I've never claimed to understand our sick leave policy uh, and I don't so I'd be curious as to how how this plays into that sick leave bank that yeah, FMLA all that just just so that I have a better understanding because that that's one animal I, I've never really grasped 
Right. Well, that's something already um, with human resources. I've reached out to say already. We're talking about how we can collaborate and work together um, because as as they work with leave for payroll purposes, we work with leave for FMLA and now for um, paid parental leave and workman's comp. I mean, there's so many ways that leave has to be used comprehensively, not just for payroll. And we want the best for our employees and we want to make sure we give them what they are due and we want to stay compliant with, with the law. I agree with all that. Any other comments or questions about this? I have a question. Sure. Snazzy. Um, microphone button. Um, so they require this and they, they don't offer money to help us pay for it, right? No, they don't. Um, I don't, I don't love that. There is another <laughs> proposal um, <laughs> that you're, that there is the, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Biden's American Families First plan. Um, that plan proposes 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave and individuals would be paid up to two thirds of their average weekly salary. And for the lowest wage workers, it's proposed they would get 80% of their salary. And the proposal is for that to be phased in over 10 years. And with the first year would be a three day bereavement. So as you can see in, I mean, this is just coming to us from the state level there at the federal level, there are also other um, proposals moving towards providing more leave for family and parental reasons. Yes. No, this would be paid leave. So they would, some people may not have the, uh, the whole purpose, this is, it does count against their leave, but some people may not have leave accrued. And I think the whole purpose for this and even the, the proposal from the Biden administration is a lot of people do not have, uh, they don't have paid leave. And they're trying to make sure that people have time to have time for bonding purposes and I think probably to help promote you know adoptions and fostering because um, in that first year parents and we can all speak from experience most of us you're going to need some some one-on-one -on -one time it is instead of having to go leave without pay and you have no pay these three weeks you would be paid well, that there's certain criteria for that. I mean, you'd have to donate. The birth the days. of a child wouldn't. Um, yeah. I haven't explored that aspect of this. I was just prepared to present this point at this, but for sick leave bank, there's a you have to exhaust your leave and go um, time without pay. You have to go without time, without pay, and then to be eligible. Right. Mm -hmm. So you yes. said they would still use their leave. So it's, they're going to get paid, but they're, it's going to count against any crude leave that they do have? Well, this would be paid leave that they have. The question is, is if they have accrued leave, would they use this leave and they and be eligible for the accrued leave, which brings you, and I don't, we don't want to open another topic for tonight. And I told my team, this is a conversation that we've really got to have is really look at what, look at our leave policy. Number one, look at our leave policy and how we want to move forward in the future because it does bring up our calendar year for FMLA. It does bring up how we look at um, life events such as this, the physical life of event and the amount of time that one is physic physically disabled with childbirth and then what um, is acceptable, acceptable medical leave covered through a physician. And so it just opens many, many doors. And um, I can assure you, yes. 
So um, I assure you, I think it was a Tuesday morning. This was the hot topic at 8.30, very early. Um, just reviewing, I think it was one phrase, just led to many, many, many other conversations that we really need to focus on our leave policy and make sure everybody's clear. Because we so have any other comments, any other comments no, or questions on no, that? No, but if you uh, have we, any questions they, in the week, if you had a worm, so we're just talking. I do want to say there's the over here on the sidebar. There's a lot of things like what if they don't have enough leave to cover the pay? Do we pay them? What ha what happens with maternity leave? I mean, we I know of specific instances, and you may too. Our maternity leave is twelve weeks, um, and we've had parents take it. Fathers have taken that the same thing. So. It, it, it's real. There's a whole new layer on this thing. We don't know the answers yet, but I know Ms. Carlisle's working on finding out. And Greg Ellington's <laughs> getting a whole new education on it, too. Any other comments, questions? Thank you for that. But in closing, yes, I, we do need to study our current leave policy and how this new bill, how this will impact that. We need to look at our FMLA calendar and um, we need to really coordinate in whatever direction we go. Um, we can't make a fast, quick response. I think we would have to really do a study to determine what is appropriate and what is appropriate for our school year, our work year, our employees, and whatever we decide to do, if we decide to do anything with any of those policies that we um, announce it um, way ahead of its implementation date, way ahead of that effectiveness date, um, just to make sure that if there are any changes that people know far in advance, just for, for planning purposes financially. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. So, so if this is a new, you know, going into policy, and I know a lot of times we, well, we table our policy changes for 30 days. How long can we table this thing until we get those kinks? Well, out? we can't. We should, it went to effect July 1st. We actually should have done this in June, so it's effective now. But we're not. We're here July the 8th. So anyway, the point to your question, Scott, we're, gonna, we're going to need to um, vote to table this policy next week. And then we'll vote it into action in August. And at that point, we'll only be month behind, but it'll be retroactive to July 1 so we can meet the policy. And then as we move forward to, Dr. to um, Ms. Carlisle's statement, we can amend the policy as necessary. But I think what we have here, um, or what we're going to vote on next week at least, is, is by law, we don't have an option. So we, we, we don't. Gotta, we got to do it and then amend it as we go. But the big thing we got to look at is see how it affects our other our other new policy, right? In I regularly call sick leave by FMLA, right? Well, this You're one, exactly I right. don't think this will impact sick leave bank, but yes, we have based on the review by GSBA and the attorneys. That was one of the points that we all reviewed that we had. This was proposed by GSBA and our attorneys reviewed it to make sure the key thing is that it aligns with all of our others and the wording and the like time increments. There's a few key pieces to that last part um, that everybody that's reviewed it says that it does, it fits the best that it can the way it was presented to us. Now for us, it's we may need to go back and look at everything else to determine if we need to make any other changes that will be most beneficial to the district, to our employees overall. But it's time for a leave review, I think. It's time for that anyways, to make sure we're That's current good. and relevant. And uh, of course, if we change any of those policies, those will have to be looked at and have to be tabled also for 30 days. Or they can be voted on. Also. However, we could choose our effective date. Let's say we do a study in August and we make a determination in, in September, we may not choose to make the effective date until January or March or August 2022. You know, so 
think we have some some leeway. Carney, did you or Scott want to have some thoughts? I'll handle it. Any other comments or questions yet? They will be coming, but thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you so much. All right, that brings us then to item F6 at the Harris County Board of Education review for approval the attached proposed 22-23 district calendar, which Dr. Denny addressed uh, earlier. Any further conversation on that? Right, we'll take action on that item next week. That's next is item F7 that the Harris County Board of Education review for approval the attached list of equipment to be designated as surplus. Uh, that too is included in your package. I'll give you just a second to peruse if you have any questions. What makes the desktop PCs surplus? So the operating system is not they sufficient. They no longer support the latest Windows up. Are there no surplus items at the middle school? I don't see the middle school listed as one of the schools. Are there no surplus items? Um, uh, if you remember, we had one just last month as well, or the month before, I can't remember. Um, so some of those, some of those items were on that one. We had so much to surplus that um, it took us, it took us two two times to get everything um, cataloged and accounted for. Yes, sir. Dr. Penny, what, what is a student responder? A student responder, a few years ago, what became the rage was we got these packages of student responders and they worked with the computer um, on a little flash drive and teacher would ask the question and the kids could um, do that. Um, so those are kind of obsolete now. Yes. Premier surplus, do they give us anything like you know, turning cans? Um, they take this stuff off of our hands um, at no cost to us uh, because if we had to go through the, um, the environmental challenges of disposing of this equipment, it would cost us quite a bit of money. Any other comments or questions on that? Thank you for that Thank explanation. You. And we're gonna we're gonna move on, but don't go very far, please, sir. That will bring us to item F8 that the Harris County Board of Education approve the request for the attached list uh, personnel to serve as tribunal panel members for the 21-22 school year. Uh, we'll take action on that item next week as well. As you're familiar, uh, we have to approve this list every year. Uh, the administrative changes. Uh, that will be taking place next year. Those were reflected on there. The new administrators are included. So if you have any questions, get Mr. Couch on that. Go ahead, please. I, I did have a question. Have we ever had any community members on this panel by chance, like pastors or Mr. Couch, like would you explain how the how the members are selected and what we're required to do? This follows the guidelines that we received from DOE 20 years ago when they first put it in place. And this is the way it says, uh, Matter of fact, I always look finally at the meeting with John Taylor, who would advise us on how to handle it. So he used to train all the staff members. So they have to be trained. So we're, we have certain criteria or as to who can be a, a member. And I'm assuming community members aren't yeah, on that right criteria. On. That's set by our board of education. No, that's set by the I need teachers on Maybe we didn't have enough administrators to have administrators. Three members? Three members? Three members? Three members plus the secretary and the enforcement. Someone over here have a question? I thought I saw hand go up. Any other comments on that? All right, then that will bring us to item uh, F9, 
Harris County Board of Education review for approval. The attached proposed intergovernmental bond resolution. Uh, Mr. Couch, uh, would you or Dr. Finney like to speak to this intergovernmental bond resolution? We're still, th this is information for y'all and, and you, you've heard a lot of this, these aspects discussed. Uh, Dr. Finney's done a good job. You can come on up. Dr. Dr. Finney's done a really good job coordinating this with Raymond James, Tom Owens, and uh, several other people. And they are coming next week. So I, I would like for you to look over it. Um, we are still in, we're moving towards next week where y'all, pass a resolution that gives us permission to work with um, our, our board of control, our board of commissioners and their, what is it, PIA? The Public Improvement Authority. Yeah, Public Improvement right. Authority to, to work on the details. You're not gonna be asked to make a decision next week, but it's just another step in the process of where we're heading. And we want y'all to have more specific information about how this thing works. And there's gonna be, there's questions coming up every day. So you may have some, if you do, please ask and we'll try to find out an answer. We don't know everything because we're working with another governmental agency and they don't know everything either until we all make a decision as a group. Two groups. So we're not, you were talking about next week, what we are going to be asked to do next week is to approve the resolution that then allows uh, you and your team, as well as I guess Raymond James at this point to, to have conversations with them, right? Yes. To move to the next step, okay. Yes, this is in, in, in coordinates with the timeline or, or the suggested timeline that yes. uh, the gentleman presented in, in Tom's absence and that you've included here, right? Yes, sir. Comments on that questions? So just for my clarification, not defending, is that even though it may be in different phases, we're going to go ahead and in this resolute or this resolution put everything that we're wanting to do in the future. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So the if you remember, and all if, the other stuff. if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I sent you the timeline with the letter of intent for the public improvement authority. Well, the public improvement authority will not sign that letter of intent until the board of education adopts an in, uh, introductory resolution allowing us to go in this direction. So if you take action on this and approve this resolution next week, the next day I can contact Randy Dowling. He will schedule a public improvement authority um, meeting on July 20th, at which time they'll sign the letter of intent that they have to sign before Raymond and James can actually speak with them. So really this resolution puts everything into motion so that they can get involved and Raymond and James can now talk to both entities. There will be a more detailed resolution that outlines terms of um, bonds and um, uh, the response roles and responsibilities of each entity um, later on but this one just gets the ball rolling so to speak and Tom Owens and I hope Ben Brooks the Raymond and James attorney um, who is in contact with both Russell Britt the county attorney and Greg Ellington our attorney um, uh, to start coordinating this um, and also come next week with Tom Owens and answer any of your questions that you may have, any and all questions to kind of coach us through this process. Greg also sent me a um, letter today that I need to, um, I think he sent it to you too, Mr. Couch, that is simply a disclaimer that um, both he and Russell Britt are of the same firm. Um, so they thought that was important disclaimer for everybody to understand that as well. So I will have that included next week. Yeah, basically, they're just saying there's no conflict of interest. Right. So we yes. understand that they're right. declaring that where there yeah. will be no conflict. Right. Yeah, no. Entities and so um, disclosure. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Thank you for Thank that. You. All right, that brings us to item G1, the Terrace County Board of Education review the attached major purchases report for the month of June 21. That is included in your package. Any questions regarding that? Is the Georgia Driving Academy something different than a truck driving school? The question was, okay, did you hear? Okay. The, the question was, is the Georgia Driving Academy different than a tr truck driving school? Yes, it is, uh, because the regulations now state 
for um, our recovery teams to go out and recover one of our school buses because the load of that school bus on our wrecker um, is exceeds it, it's basically the equivalent of a tractor trailer so they have to have that endorsement on their cdl so we had to send um, four of our mechanics back to truck driving school uh, to get that certification so that they can go recover buses thank you for that explanation so, yes sir how many um I don't have that number right now. I'm going to get that number for you for next next week. Any other comments, questions? Thank you, sir. Again. All right, that brings us to item G2 that the Harris County Board of Education review for review the attached financial report from June 30, 2021. Uh, I'm amazed I'm even calling that date. Mr. Couch, any comments here? That's always encouraging. Uh, let me ask, so June 30, that's the end of the fiscal year. Is this, is this the end of the year report? Or? We still have some things to finish up and then and actually it goes through the end of July. Okay. Uh, there's still some things that can be done. Okay. Taken care of. In actuality, there's some things that go on in, in into September 30th. I yeah, I was gonna say, I was thinking we, we really won't know the, the final final number until somewhere in the fall, right? right. Picking up money. <laughs> we that's probably related to the fact that we just you know had an increase. We we're in a growing county. We're having more things come up. Uh, you know our property digest went up. There's a lot of different things came in revenue that wasn't uh, anticipated. Didn't, didn't anticipate. We'll take care of it, everyone. Steve. Well, that's uh, Steve today. Yeah, that's right. So. Yeah, I think, Mr. Cows, to your point, though, it is important to, to realize that this is the end of June. There's some ancillary stuff, I'm sure, to come, but uh, only 98% of the budget uh, was spent, which is a testament to the controlled cost, um, especially in a year when there were significant challenges with that. And we had some savings, right? Because of the challenges and we had some expenses we weren't expecting because of the challenges. So thank you to you and your team for uh, for managing those costs well. It was definitely a team effort and, and there were a lot of things involved with it. And then, yeah, we did have a lot of challenges, including the budget cuts and a lot of stuff at the very beginning. You know, we were a little nervous this time last year, sure. but uh, with the help of a lot of people involved with it, uh, we were able to have a good year economically. I also uh, want to point out uh, an item that you mentioned earlier, and that is the, um, the general fund balance at 14.5. Uh, that is, that's amazing uh, and significant, um, even from where it was when, when I came on five years ago. So, oh, I remember. Yes, I do. Poor Kelly was sweating it. Which, which again is, is is encouraging because it means that you know the property values are are increasing the revenue is coming in we have some some extra funds to 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 do some things with um that we have not had before and uh, you know i mean we, we we need to be mindful of course and be good stewards uh of the funds that the county um taxpayers provide us at the same time uh, when we have a surplus like that it's important that we uh improve our facilities. So I go back to the statement order. We've got to do both ends. Any other comments on the budget? Miss I thank you, you and your team for getting this to us so quickly. Appreciate that. Uh, and that brings us then to item G3, that the Harris County Board of Education review the attached school nutrition programs financial report. Uh, and that is also a glimmer of eight. Uh, Mr. Couch, any comments on that? No, I'll be happy to answer any questions or, or Ms. Baker can, but, you know, obviously when we transferred 1.6 million three or four years ago to pay up where we were, we're in much better shape. Definitely. I remember as well, Steve. Um, 
That's exciting. Any other comments or questions? All right, then we will move on to item H that the Harris County Board of Education review news and information or share news and information they might have with the community and the rest of the board. And I'm gonna start with uh, on my left, Miss Oliver tonight. I just wanted to say what a wonderful um, opportunity it was and, and to thank all of you and, and Mr. Couch. Thank you for letting me go to the um, conference. The summer conference was wonderful. It was great to be there, even in the overflow room. It was nice. Great to see so many familiar faces. Nice to hear stories. It was refreshing to share ours. Um, I know you guys hear us say it a lot, but when you go to a conference like that, it's really nice to be able to hear stories from other districts and go, you mean that's not the norm where you are? You know, to hear and to, to, to take a moment and to truly be grateful for the people we have here, for the family feel we have here, for the, um, the desire to see that each child receives the best education they possibly can if they live in Harris County. That is a blessing. So thank you for letting me attend the conference. I learned so much, so many great books I came home with and um, I'm just very grateful. So thank you. Nice, Dr. Sparks. I enjoyed the conference. I attended virtually as well as the delegate um, virtual conference. Both were exceptional. I enjoyed the virtual just because I got a chance to go to more than one session. Very nice, Mr. Goodenough. Um, I really don't have anything other than I hope all the teachers and staff enjoy their summer recess too. I know they need to recoup from that last year. <laughs> yes, I would agree, um, Mr. Ray. Sorry, I too had a uh, a good time at the GSBA conference. Uh, networking with other districts and and seeing how they handled you know the big the big topic was the, of course the pandemic and how they dealt with it and you know we it to to piggyback off what Ms. Oliver said we we had a lot better plan than a lot of these districts did and we had our students in class in school where a lot of districts did, weren't even able to to manage that so Again, kudos to all of our folks that, that made that happen. Um, and of course, we always learn a lot at those, at those uh, conferences, but hopefully we'll get away from the, the virtual aspect and get back to in-person because that was not always pleasant during that, during that uh, event, but <clears throat> they made it work. Uh, thank you to uh, the folks that invited us to the safety luncheon at the new middle school. That was awesome uh, to get to meet some of those contractors and workers that have been putting that building together for us. Uh, that was a great opportunity for Freeman and associates to uh, recognize, you know, their, their folks or their workers. Uh, the food was great and the tour was even better to see the progress that's going on over there. If you haven't had an opportunity to ride by just every day on the outside, something changes. So it's just awesome. And we all look forward to that. And, uh, just a special thanks to our staff, uh, principals, teachers, lunchroom staff, para pros, all that, that worked extra over the summer to uh, give our students that opportunity to catch up and uh, have that op extra opportunity to learn. Uh, I know it was, I I've heard from several parents that uh, had children involved in it and they thought it, it was great. Uh, based off the surveys that Dr. Denny showed earlier that I, I couldn't agree more. They, they enjoyed it and wished it was, it was longer. So uh, thank you to all those staff that gave of their time to uh, take time out of your summer schedule for that. That's it. Mr. Green. Um, Mr. Ray took about all my thunder. So the only thing I'll say is that I hope everybody is enjoying their summer break and continue to enjoy that for the next month. And next month I'll be here before you know it. Indeed it will. 
And so uh, with that depressive comment, uh, you think you, Mr. Proctor? Mr. Couch. Uh, real quick, I, I do want to say that back when we first realized we were going to receive money for learning loss and, and summer enrichment was being encouraged, you know, we were all kind of going, man, we just want to get out of here. We don't want to come back and do anything during the summer. But a lot of teachers bought into it. Everybody in this room, including Valerie Longshore back there, had a lot of input to it with transportation, with feeding kids, with doing instructional stuff, with bringing in activities. Dave and Aaron worked really, really hard to set up a good program. So with the academic emphasis in the morning and then the activities in the afternoon and, and working with all those teachers and giving them opportunity to work with the kids, it worked out really, really well. Jay Borden did a fantastic job down at the steam farm. Um, and, and to see kids happy and excited is, is contagious and the teachers were the same way. So a lot of the people that were involved with it, even though they were tired from the year, that I don't know, interaction with kids. Um, and I have to say, Miss Sawyer, who was teaching virtual, was so excited to have kids in her classroom. And there were a lot of teachers in that same situation. And they did a really, really good job. And the principals and the assistant principals are really to be commended for their achievement with it. I do think we ought to consider making it maybe three weeks, but we'll have to sell that. Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I absolutely agree with everything that's been said. Also want to, um, just add a little bit uh, uh, and say how excited I was to go by the Mercer Medicine building and see a sign up that there's a construction crew beginning work. And so let me just say thank you to Mr. Marlowe and his development team, uh, the partnership with the county uh, and with Mercer that is making that happen. So uh, the fact that there's a construction crew in there getting ready to, to remodel that thing and that hopefully it will be open to the public sometime first of next year is exciting. So uh, that's, that's good to see. Very good to see. Uh, all right, with that said, then I will entertain a motion that we enter executive session to discuss or deliberate upon the appointment, employment, compensation, hiring, disciplinary action or dismissal or periodic evaluation or rating of a public officer or employee or to interview applicants for the position of superintendent. Ms. Oliver, second by Mr. Proctor. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll be excused to executive session this time.
Uh, the question was, do we have any idea how many viewers we get? Dave knows that, correct? You can look it up. So, I will entertain a motion that we reconvene from open from executive session. Mr. Proctor, second by Mr. Goodenow. Any discussion? All those in favor? And I need a motion that we adjourn. Mr. Green and Mr. Ray, uh, all those in favor? And we are adjourned.